Good morning. The Lord's generosity is not for the sake of our comfort, but rather for the sake of our character. Let me say that one more time. The Lord's generosity is not given for the sake of our comfort, but rather for the sake of our character. We heard that this week. Christina said it during our encouragement, uh, midweek encouragement, and it struck me because it's perfect. God gives us everything we need for life in Christ Jesus. I've thought a lot about dependence on God and how to muster that dependence up. And dependence on God is really hard to find when it's mostly conceptual. And generally, that's how I feel is that dependence on God, I got to figure that one out. But of late, and I bet a lot of people feel this way as well, dependence feels more actual. We're, we're in new spaces. We're, we don't have things that are predictable like, they are, like, they're, like we're used to. Nothing's as consistent. And for me, that's been bringing my faith a little bit more into focus. It's been simplifying it a little bit because I'm realizing, okay, God, that's what you want. You want me to need you right now because everything else is crazy. And that is what he wants. He does want us to put him in the center. Uh, do we follow Jesus when things are out of control? That is what he wants of his people, to follow him and put him at the center. So let's do that now. Let's put him at the center and bring ourselves before him as we sing together. God bless you this morning.
As we continue with worship, I want you to take a moment to realize that God often places people on our hearts. And during this time, even though so much has been taken away from what we can do, when it comes to looking outward to others, we always have the ability to pray and intercede and take people before the throne room of God. So I want to give you 30 seconds, connect with the Lord, see who he is placing on your heart, and then take them in prayer to God and see what he has for them. Heavenly Father, we as a united body are, are bringing people that are on our hearts to you, Lord. We want to lift them up. We want their, your will for them, and we want them to see you and to hold on to you as beautiful and as the most important thing. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us this opportunity to bring them before you so that you can take care of them, so that they can be in your hands, God. We give you these people now. Amen. Thank you. 
So today we'll be continuing our One Another series and looking at how we're called to forgive each other. And this is Ephesians 4, 29 through 5, 2. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we're nearing the end of the summer, and that means we're nearing the end of our series on the one another's of Scripture. And this morning, we look at a one another that gets to the very heart of the gospel, the gospel of forgiveness. And you find it there in verse 32, where Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. So today, we're going to talk about what it means to forgive one another. And really, you know, in a Christian community full of broken people who are going to hurt one another, forgiveness is one of the most essential qualities of our lives together. That we learn how to walk in forgiveness towards one another. And so what I want to do this morning is first just acknowledge the challenge of forgiveness. And then second, talk about what forgiveness is. And then finally, I want to talk about the path to true forgiveness as Paul outlines it here. So first... This is obvious, but let's just acknowledge the challenge of forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness does not come naturally. I was thinking this week, you know what comes naturally is fairness and justice. Those of us who've had kids, we know that fairness just comes so naturally to our children, right? The words not fair just pour out of their mouths. We don't have to teach them those words. The words I forgive you are much harder to teach. So it just doesn't come naturally to many of us. And add on to that, the fact that we've grown up, most of us, in a particular culture that I think, based on our culture, presents us with some unique challenges towards forgiveness. And here's what I mean. Those of us that have grown up in Western American Christianity, I would say we've, we've grown up uh, developing a strong sense of self, if I, if I could put it that way, that we have these pretty well-developed egos that uh, feel strongly about a certain expectation of their rights and their privileges and and what is owed us. And I'm grateful for some of that, but I think that presents some unique cultural challenges to forgiveness because those those big egos can get easily offended, easily slighted. Um, We can pretty easily feel like we deserve something better than we're getting. And so I think that's just a, a set of unique challenges that we have as Americans. And then you add on to that, Uh, six months of COVID life, where all of us are now tired, we're worn down, we might be frustrated, we might be anxious, we're just not always presenting the best version of ourselves to one another. And you put that all on top of each other, and I would say there's a pretty good guess that there are other believers in your lives right now um, who you may need to work on forgiving. That in the last couple weeks, maybe you've had a conversation may have been with a spouse or it may have been with a friend um, that left you wounded, that left you angry or maybe even offended. Or you've received an email or a text or you've seen a post that leaves you, you know, really bitter. Or I think just some of us have been living in close quarters with one another for an extended period of time, whether that be roommates or family members. And so we've just had more time to have our brokenness leak out on each other more often. All that to say, I think we're in this place where there's probably some forgiveness needed for for a lot of us. And and I just, you know, this is so obvious, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that forgiveness is hard. It's hard work. You know, the reality is God forgave us at the cost of the death of his son. It cost him a lot. To, to bring forgiveness. And forgiveness tends to cost. It's not easy. It costs. It's, it's hard work. So again, that's pretty obvious, but I think that's, that's important to acknowledge together. Uh, second, let's just talk about what forgiveness is. This is all review, of course, but um, 
I want to talk a little bit about what, what forgiveness is, and there's so many different ways you could do that, but I'm, I want to look at uh, two of the words that are used for forgiveness in the scriptures. Um, the first is the one that Paul uses here in verse 32 when he says that we are to uh, forgive one another. And what's embedded in that word forgive is actually the Greek word for grace. The word, word is charis, some of you have heard of. So literally he says we should be kind and compassionate to one another, uh, caressing each other, or we might say gracing each other. So what is forgiveness? Well, it is this choice to extend grace to one another, right? It's this posture of extending grace. And what is grace? But it is unmerited favor. It is something that is not deserved. They may actually deserve fairness in this moment, but forgiveness is choosing to offer them something that they don't deserve, offer grace, gracing them. And this word, gracing, is paired with these other two wonderful postures, be kind and compassion, right? Kindness. Our world is in such need of kindness right now, and, and it's such an underrated quality sometimes, but kindness is a posture we offer to one another. And then compassion, that we should have these hearts that go out to one another, even in the midst of all of our imperfections. So all that to say, forgiveness is this choice to proactively extend grace to a person in a way that maybe they don't deserve. Now, Jesus actually uses a different word for forgiveness than the one Paul uses here. Um, he uses uh, a really simple word. You find it like in the Lord's Prayer where Jesus says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And the word he uses there is not even a religious word. It's just a word that means to let go or to, to release. And so I actually love that simple meaning, to let go or release. And the metaphor he often uses is like financial debt, right? So someone owes us something. There's a debt that they are to repay. And rather than requiring repayment, we, we simply let go. We, we release them from the debt they owe. They are in some way in bondage to us morally because of what they've done. And forgiveness is simply choosing to let go and to release that person from a certain kind of bondage, saying, I, I'm not going to hold you in that prison anymore. I'm not going to hold you in that debt. I release you. I let go. You, you're entirely free of what you've done. That's what forgiveness is. Um, look, at, look at verse 31. Paul says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And really, when we forgive someone, we are, in a sense, saying, I release you from the bondage of my, my bitterness towards you, my rage and my anger and my malice. I'm not going to hold you in that prison anymore. And one of the beautiful things about forgiveness is, of course, that when we choose to release somebody from that prison, we also, in our own ways, we release ourselves from that prison of, of bitterness and rage and anger. I love this quote from Louis B. Smead's famous quote. He says this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. And that's a beautiful idea. You know, these qualities in verse 31, bitterness, rage, anger. Um, that's a prison to live in those postures. And the truth is probably all of us have had examples in our lives, moments where we've lived in that prison of, of anger in bitterness and we stew and, and we can't seem to get out of it. And it really is a prison. And what can make it really complicated is sometimes there's been people who have wounded us and the wounds have been so deep and so painful and those people may be dead, right? Or, or they'll never acknowledge what they've done in the fullness of what they've done to us. And so in those cases, like true reconciliation isn't actually possible in this life at least. And yet, even in those cases, I think there is still a work of forgiveness, a work of letting go, a, a work of release um, for our own sakes, also, as much as for theirs, especially if the re reconciliation isn't possible. But that's what, that's what forgiveness is. It is this proactive extending of grace and it is this choice to simply let go and to release a person and to release ourselves from a certain kind of bondage. And I, I just couldn't help but think about um, the story of Hamilton. And I know many of you know that Hamilton's been released on TVs. And so 
The music of Hamilton has been nonstop in the Gunlock household over the last month or so. But there's this scene in that play of this moment of incredible forgiveness that that so beautifully captures the the release and the freedom that comes. And without giving too much details, uh, Alexander Hamilton has done something that has really, really wounded his wife. And so she's really bitter, uh, appropriate, so, uh, very much uh, appropriately so, and angry. And he is feeling the, the guilt and the remorse. They've experienced loss in their family. So there's a moment where he's just walking around on the stage in the midst of that guilt and remorse and grief. And then she comes out. And as she comes out, she comes out and her, her face is just like steel. It's just hardened. You can just tell she's gone into this protective, self-protective mode. And she's just steeled and stone-faced. And he's kind of confessing and he's sharing his, his remorse. And you watch her face just slowly soften. And there's this beautiful moment where she just, they're standing side by side. She just reaches down and she grabs his hand. And it is this expression of forgiveness. And he just totally breaks down and starts weeping. And you see her weeping, her face is softened. But what it is, is this beautiful picture of release, of letting go of you. You watch two people in a moment who are both in their own prison and how the courage of her forgiveness enabled both of them to be released from this prison on his hand of, of guilt and shame and remorse and on hers of anger and bitterness and resentment. So beautiful, but all that to say, forgiveness is this extension of grace. It is this choosing to let go. Finally, and most importantly, uh, what is the path to true forgiveness, at least as Paul articulates it? And this is the thing I, I most want you to hear this morning. Again, I know this is all kind of review, but really important to say, and it's this that the path to forgiveness is always vertical before it is horizontal. And what I mean by that is that the pathway to truly forgiving another person is always about our vertical relationship with God and engaging him before actually is about the horizontal relationship with the person and engaging them. And it's really interesting when scripture talks about forgiveness, it almost never goes vertical. It almost never says things like you should forgive because that person's not so bad in the end, or um, you know they deserve a second chance, or even because uh, God loves them, or or because you'll feel better if you do it. It never does that. It. it always takes us right into the very heart of our relationship with God, and that's exactly what Paul does in this passage. Let me read it to you again, verse thirty-two: Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul says to forgive, and then he immediately goes vertical and says, look at what God has done for you in Jesus. God has forgiven you. Jesus has sacrificed himself for you. You are dearly loved children. God has extended his grace to you. God has let go and he's released you from that prison. You are entirely free. That is the very heart of the gospel. So Paul's saying, you need to take that in. You need to eat that up. You need to drink your fill of that until you're living in it and you're swimming in it. And then you can offer that same gospel to your brother or sister who's offended you. And that is the vertical dimension. Of forgiveness. And what's so beautiful is that when we're able to truly forgive another person, what it demonstrates is it demonstrates we are actually living in the gospel. It shows us, I actually believe this stuff and it's becoming real in my life. This is, this is authentic because look, I'm able to offer this gospel to another person. And that's, on the other hand, what makes a lack of forgiveness for others so concerning because it demonstrates that we don't actually understand the gospel at all. Or if we, if we get it up here, we're not living in the gospel in that particular moment. We are disconnected from the very heart of what the gospel is, which is the forgiveness of, of God that he offers to us in Jesus Christ. And so in those moments when, when we're unable to for, forgive, it actually begs the question, 
Do I actually see God as this deeply gracious being who has all sorts of forgiveness for me or not? I love this quote from Scott Hubbard. He puts it this way. For many of us, the God of our unredeemed imagination has a small and shriveled heart. If this God forgives at all, he does so as a sovereign Scrooge ever dangling our debts over our heads. And sometimes when we can't forgive, that it reveals that's kind of our view of God. But then he goes on to say this beautifully. But this is not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose heart is broad as the heavens, deep as the seas, kind as the morning sun. If we travel into the inner chambers of God's heart, we will find the home of everything pleasant, mercy, grace, and enough forgiveness to cover the world twice over. <laughs> Beautiful picture of the gospel of who our God is. And so all that to say the first task of forgiveness is to go vertical and to sit before the throne of grace and to feel the sweet relief of being released from all of our sins by this God who is overwhelmingly loving and gracious and forgiving of, of us. And then we might be able to extend that to one another. So to bring this home, to make this practical, I want you to imagine a moment right now where something has just happened that has left you angry and bitter. And you might not have to go back very far to imagine it. But maybe you've you, know, you got in a fight with your spouse. You guys said some things you shouldn't have said. Now you're in separate rooms of the house and you're just kind of stewing right now. Or you had a conversation with a friend that, that really left you just angry and bitter. Or you received a text or an email that was just so insensitive and just really immature. And whatever it is, and you're, feeling, you're in that moment, the temptation for us as we're sitting in that moment is always to go horizontal, right? And what I think most of us do is we start imagining conversations that we desperately want to have with this person, right? All the things we really want to say, we start constructing arguments that will just demolish them and put them in their place and enact justice. And instead, what we need to do in that moment is we need to take that moment vertically. We just go straight to God and we cry out to him. We say, Lord, I am angry. I'm bitter. I want fairness. I want justice, but I'm coming to you instead. And I need you. I need your spirit in this moment. I need the gospel. I need to be reminded of what the gospel is. Bring perspective right now of all that you've done for me in Jesus Christ. Convince my heart of something right now. Convince my heart of a very simple truth. And this is the simple truth I think we need. It's this, God, that you are enough. I know that sounds simple, but like that's what we need in that moment. That truly, God, you are enough are enough for me, that I don't need to seek validation from the world, and I do not need to enact justice relationally in the world, that, that you're enough, that the fact that you see me right now, that you care for me, that your heart breaks for me, that you know everything that's going on right now, that that would be enough, the fact that your forgiveness is enough, the fact that the justice that you enact in the world in your timing is enough. Convince me <laughs> that that's enough, that you're enough so that you would release me and free me to be able to just let go. As simple as that, to be able to let go and release this person and forgive them. Lord, I need you right now. That's the vertical path. And that's how forgiveness happens. I mean, in the end, I think true forgiveness is a work of God. It is a spiritual, supernatural work. It is not a natural work. So let's take that path to God every single time. And maybe you need to do that even right now. All that to say, let's be imitators of God and walk as dearly loved children. Walk in the love that we've received from Jesus. Forgiveness is one of the most powerful responses that we could ever have. Yet forgiving others can be so very hard. The love of Christ is the only way we can set free those who have deeply wounded us because the love of Christ gives us the only context we have for believing God has forgiven us. There is perhaps no greater gift you can offer God than a heart that knows the power of forgiveness and decides to set others free. Forgiving others shows that the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus 
are operating in our lives. If you find it hard to forgive others, you need to remember this is a spiritual work that needs to be done in your heart. True forgiveness is not something that you can bootstrap yourself. You need a work of God. So let's go to God together right now in this regard. Let's take a moment to consider, is there someone you have an unforgiving heart towards? If so, bring that person before the Lord right now. Maybe it's a parent who hurt you long ago, or a child who has rebelled or frustrated you, or maybe a friend who injured you. Whoever it is, whatever it is, ask God right now to give you a heart to forgive them. You are calling upon the God who gave up his son to suffer and die to forgive you of your transgressions. This God who by his power raised Christ from the dead, and it is that power that is available and at work in your life. When we forgive, we not only set others free from what we think they owe us, we set ourselves free from the prison that an unforgiving heart creates in us. So let's call upon him now. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness in our lives. Every wayward moment, every rebellious act, our half-hearted devotion, our idolatrous and self-centered ways. Lord, you know these things in our lives and you took all of those things with you on the cross, absorbing them, crucifying them, and then graciously telling us we are free from that debt. As far as the east is from the west, gone, forever not counted against us. Lord, as we move through our days and encounter people who hurt us or do wrong against us, may we be ever mindful of the ongoing state of forgiveness we live in as your children. And may we, in kind, have an ongoing posture of forgiveness towards those who offend us. Lord, we acknowledge the impossible task that this is, apart from your resurrection power at work in our lives. So Lord, may that power permeate us. Help us, Lord, to walk in righteousness, peace, and joy, demonstrating your life here on earth. And may we choose to be people who are kind and compassionate, forgiving others just as you forgave us. In Jesus' name, amen. In every station, new trials, new troubles, call for more grace than I can afford. Where can I go but to my dear Savior? Just like a child, 
My hopes and desires seek a new destination And all that you ask, your grace will provide Grace upon grace and be sin repaid Every void restored, you will find him there In every turning, he will prepare you With grace upon grace For oh, grace upon grace, every sin repaired Every void restored, you will find With grace upon grace. Well, we hope that you've been encouraged this morning, and we would invite you now to consider some of the reflection questions that we'll put on the screen for you. And let me just end our time with this benediction. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, and power through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.